The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Burrows and Burbs with hosts John Ingle and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs 87. I'm John Engel of Douglas Elliman in Connecticut, and that's my co-host on Roberto. 75th and Columbus, world headquarters for Burrows and Burbs, Roberto Cabrera. Say hi. Hello. Thank you, John. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and my other special guest this week, Sheila D. Simmons in Brentwood, Los Angeles. Say hi. Hello. Now, Sheila and I met, and she said, you ought to do a show on Brentwood. And I said, Brentwood? That's that's just a neighborhood in Los Angeles. And she said, no, no, it's a, it's a lot more. And I said, what are we going to talk about? The rich and famous in Brentwood? We all on the East Coast think about Brentwood as the place w- w- where OJ lives. And she said, no, 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 that's a 20-year-old story. Brentwood is so much more. And I said, well, I, I know the Getty is there. And she said, yeah, the Getty is the mo- is, is one example of great design in Brentwood. We should put together a show on the mid-century modern roots of Brentwood and how that tradition has continued into the present day. And I'm going to find you two of the most extraordinary architects of that modern movement, both the restoration of mid-century modern in Brentwood and the modern houses that they're doing now in Brentwood. And we're going to talk about what makes Brentwood as a neighborhood different from all the other neighborhoods in L.A. Did I get that right, Sheila? That's correct, John. Are you ready for me to take over for just a moment? Yeah, I want you to introduce these special architects. Oh, okay. Uh, our architects are from Enclosures Architect Architectures, and they are Scott Strummeyer and Tosh Rabier. Did I say that correctly? Uh, Strum Scott Strumwasser and Tosh Rabar. Okay, so I have not met them personally, but I will say they came uh, uh, recommended from one of my clients, and my client is an MC. Am enthusiasts, so I knew that they were top rated. Um, what I do want to say about Brentwood, I do, before we uh, get started on the MCM aspect, I have to give you our market update for April. So our median sold price here is 3.4 million. Price per square foot is 1,695. And properties on the market right now uh, are 114 uh, homes for sale. Now, what I will say about Brentwood that is kind of a myth. Everyone thinks that we have these huge homes and uh, everything is, you know, a, a, a gated community. That's not necessarily true. People like Brentwood because we are on the west side. We are west side of the 405 freeway. But what people don't understand is it's it, it, we have a Mayberry feel. It's a small idyllic neighborhood. Our main thoroughfare is San Vicente Boulevard. And it's a coral tree line um, a street that houses most of the uh, businesses along San Vicente, including our Douglas Elliman headquarters here in Brentwood. But I, I cannot say enough about our shops, our local businesses, our restaurants, but the neighborhood, it, it lends itself uh, to a healthy outdoor lifestyle, but it's unassuming, it's idyllic, and people do not expect that when they come to Brentwood. They think that, you know, we're Beverly Hills. We're not Beverly Hills. We have the same cachet, but I will tell you, I think we do have higher net worth here than Beverly Hills, but people like it because it's, you know, uh, it's a small, quaint uh, neighborhood. And- Can I just ask you to give us a little perspective on the, just those three or four numbers that you gave us, because we're, we're, those numbers are in a vacuum. I don't understand what those mean. Like where were, how, 
how has that changed since, say, pre-COVID? Are the numbers down, up, sideways? So I'll give you year over year. So for uh, April 2022, we are up 5.4% in the median price. So uh, people think that, you know, with the market's getting ready to crash, it's not crashing here in Brentwood. Um, as far as the uh, price per square foot, uh, let me see here. Yes, we're up 21% from last year. How about and, inventory numbers? You said 105 available uh, or something? 114. Uh, we are down uh, two, two homes from last year. <laughs> So last year was 116. This year we're at 114. And the, uh, and, and uh, days on the market uh, are 37. Last year is 29. So we are, you know, they're it's sitting for just a few more days, you know, another week or so. But people think we're crashing. We're not crashing. So the, the only problem that we have right now is we do have low inventory and we need more sellers. So if you are if you have an inclination to to sell, please call me. So when I look at the map here, I see Crestwood Hills looks like a big section, physically about half of all of Brentwood. And then you have Brentwood Park, Brentwood Heights, Brentwood, and Westgate. Those seem to be the areas of, but Crestwood Hills dominates with about 50% of the total total area. Is that right? That's correct. And that's and, this is where I will let Scott take over. Okay, go ahead, Scott. Uh, and here I go. Well, I am Scott Stromwasser sitting here with my partner. Um, Tosh Rabar, um, uh, we are uh, architects and uh, we have a firm that's been established for several decades now. Um, uh, my uh, connection to, to all of this is um, that I'm, I was actually born and raised in Brentwood. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so I'm very familiar with that neighborhood and, and I think Sheila characterizes uh, the community well. It is, uh, it is a kind of unassuming place with, um, that's, that's, that's very, it's a very livable and, and kind of wonderful place to be and to grow up. Um, and uh, the, the Crestwood Hills area specifically is a series of, is a canyon that goes up uh, um, uh, north of Sunset Boulevard and and houses some some really quite beautiful uh, or has some quite beautiful homes. Um, the Crestwood Hills area specifically was um, developed by a, a handful of musicians actually who wanted to build some homes that were um, affordable and that were um, architecturally uh, sensible and 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 uh, um, they they actually created a mutual housing association and and I think they were in the business of of, of making uh, some some money but they're also very responsible about uh, how they were going to um, develop these properties what year um, was that Scott more or less that was um, in and around the 50s Okay. And they actually developed, um, they developed not only um, a series of homes, but they developed a, a, a nursery school or a, a, that, that I attended. And there's something called Crested Hills Park, which was the place I went to every day. And it's up in the, it's up in the hills and, and, and it's just, it's very beautiful and very idyllic. But um, they were very interested in using, you know, architects and contemporary architects and develop these properties. You're looking at a home right now um, that one of the, the models of it is, is, is one that, that looks very much like that. That, we, that was one of our first projects as young professionals that we restored and, and remodeled. So um, they really uh, were interested in, in, in sharing contemporary ideas and taking advantage of, of, um, of, of the sites that were really quite beautiful. I'm going to interject. There's a part that's missing a part of the history of Crestwood Hills is that most of the people that developed this area were musicians, but they also were immigrants that came from Europe. And the idea of creating a home that is much more egalitarian that, and then it's um, available. It, they created a society, they created a community where 
people in that neighborhood could go to the neighborhood school and the park, and it was much more um, available. It wasn't gated, but it was something that was nestled under the trees. So it, it was that kind of a thinking that came into this area that wasn't there before. Um, so that's what I want to just contribute to that. So who, who who's moving to Brentwood now and why? I mean, when I think, okay, if I've got I've got my new big job in LA and I can go to Malibu, I can go to Beverly Hills, I can go anywhere I want. But a lot of the people who can go anywhere choose Brentwood. Why? Partly it's uh, location. It's closer, close to the beach. It's close to the freeway where you can, uh, 405 where you can, if there is no traffic, you can get to other parts of the city. Um, it's, so it's well located. It's beautiful. It's a beautifully landscape. Um, and I think it's a little bit under the radar too, because Malibu has all these things associated with it. And it's also, Malibu is a sort of isolated part of the city. If you want to be isolated, that's a good place to be. Beverly Hills has its character and, and but Brentwood is, is a little bit under, Sheila, you tell me if I'm right about this. It's a little under the radar. It, it is under the radar, John. And I will tell you um, what I have found in real estate Families want to move here. I have people who call me from Palm Springs and say, I want my daughter, you know, in school. So we're going to buy. And, uh, and and I would tell you, once uh, when I had a listing here, I took my signs to Malibu. I drove them to Malibu, placed them. And sure enough, I got Malibu residents who wanted to, to purchase here because of the schools. Um, so I, I think, you know, families... Um, First time home buyers, I'm not sure. I mean, there's South Brentwood, which is the condo section, but I think it's, you know, those people who are, have an ex, uh, expanding family. What about Bel Air? Uh, Bel, well, I hear, okay, so I know a celebrity client who lived in Bel Air and they said they, they loved Bel Air, but it's hilly there. I have to tell you, there are a lot of hills. And uh, I, you don't think about that, but I think that once you tour those homes and, you know, you get uh, up in those streets, you, and your GPS crashes and, and you realize, you know, what um, a tour it can be driving up and down. But I mean, Bel Air is beautiful. I mean, who doesn't love Bel Air? And but I've so the topography of, of Brentwood is moderately flat. Yeah. Not, 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 not really, but it's just, it's just a little bit easier to navigate Brentwood and, and, and also Brentwood has what Sheila was talking about. It has this, the San Vicente Boulevard, which is, you know, that is literally a place I would, I would get on my bicycle as a child and ride my bike to San Vicente Boulevard and go to the hobby shop. And I mean, it was, it was Mayberry. It was, it was, and and it's not that anymore, but it's also it still is in some ways. It is the community of Brentwood, and Bel Air doesn't really have that. And uh, um, it's it it is this sort of small town within a very big town, and it's 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 more unassuming, and it's also off to the corner, being north of Sunset like that. Bel Air is that way too, but it's a little bit it's a little bit more accessible. I could walk. I walked. Up, a half a block to school when I was a child to my grade school, um, and uh, um, it, there's a it's a kind of it's a kind of special place. It's got this notoriety because of a certain football player, but it's it really is it it, it really is a, a a very comfortable kind of place to to be. And 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 also one other thing because I just don't want to neglect that this part of it. Um, I've, we've talked a little bit about it, but there is a sensibility about architecture in Brentwood and that there are quite a few um, very um, interesting and very uh, sensitively designed because of topography issues and because of view issues, um, buildings within Brentwood for which um, I think Brentwood takes a lot of pride. And folks that are that have a kind of interest in that and have a sensitivity about, you know, building homes that are built that that have this kind of uh, uh, attention to where they are and their their context is is very evident in Brentwood and it's it's something it's something for that I think really gives it gives it a lot of value in you know in, in communities like Ma Malibu and Bel Air and in uh, 
um, in Beverly Hills, you get more, um, you know, there are some sort of extravagances there that that you don't find as much of in 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 Brentwood, but you find some very very beautiful pieces of architecture, some from this mid century period, and newer ones that that realize where they are and build that way. So let's talk about modern architecture. And let me just give you my perspective. And then I want to hear the California perspective. From my perspective, World War II ends and the country is basically starting over. It's got to create a lot of housing and it's got to create it quickly and inexpensively. And there was an opportunity, I guess, for this modern movement to begin in the 50s. Um, in the East, we have the Harvard Five. You have the Harvard Five come out of Harvard with uh, Marcel Breuer, Philip Johnson, Johansson, Elliot Noyes, and they come to New Canaan when Philip Johnson gets the job at the Museum of Modern Art. He gets the job, the first job running the architecture department. And they come out here and they do, I think there's 90 of them here in New Canaan. And they, uh, they are characterized as glass boxes. The famous, most famous of these is the Philip Johnson glass house. And here's a photo of it uh, right here. So this is what we see in New Canaan, and this is the highest in the in New Canaan is the highest concentration in the Northeast of mid-century modern. So we talk about the Harvard Five in this area. When we talk about Brentwood, there's a whole different vocabulary. There's a whole different set of designers. I keep hearing the same names coming up. Neutra, N-E-U-T-R-A, Neutra. Uh, I keep hearing, who are the other names? Help me out. Schindler and uh, uh, Quincy Jones, A. Quincy Jones, Gregory Ain. Um, yeah, these are the, these are the, the, the uh, Irv Gill? Oh, yeah. Gill is a little earlier. But, but yeah, we have our, we have our five or 10 or however many. That were that were part of and and Skinner. yeah here here's an example why don't you talk about this project um this was built in 1957 correct yeah. uh, by Wilkes I think yeah. that's his name um we just re uh, restored it for, um a year ago didn't add anything to it it all it was already all there we just uh, had to upgrade it to 21st century needs um nothing had been done to it original uh since uh, the original time that was built um so this house is in beverly hills which is a different setting but similar to what what has gone on in brantwood this is the same time that these houses were being built all over Lo los angeles you know, what you hear about a ranch style house or a, web, or a post and beam house, these are reiteration of um, Neutra and Schindler, which were doing work in the early 20s. And, and, um, and so this is 30 years later that it's being understood by younger architects at the time that were actually studying and working for Neutra and Schindler and then they started to do their own work. And so you can see all the students do very interesting but similar work around the city. Quincy Jones, Alan Ashen, all those architects were influenced by Neutra and Schindler. How um, do I know that these are LA, mid-century modern? How do I know that these the aren't the You know, the wood post and beam is well it's not necessarily just LA it's northern california as well uh post and beam um wood construction is very much LA uh you don't really on the, on the east coast this wouldn't survive the weather um you have you, you know is that even, the reason why the floors are like cement or terrazzo or i mean there are honestly no wood floors Okay, the pro the the issue the one of the one most brilliant thing that this this these architects at the time did, they were introduced to radiant heating, and these homes have all 
have radiant heating. And to do that, it's best to do it with concrete slab and is the best heating for these homes. You know, it doesn't blow air force, uh, forced air heating it blows on you. It's terrible. It's it's splotchy, and you know you get it in some place in a house. That's so don't get it in another place. This is very continuous and consistent, and it's perfect for this environment because we don't have that much um, temperature difference from winter to summer. We have yeah. We have a lot of we have a lot of a lot more flexibility in what we do here because. Because of, uh, exactly what Tasha is saying, we don't we our our climatic conditions allow us to make uh, you, in this photograph. You can see we've actually uh, created a room in which you can pull all the doors back, and now that now it's an outdoor patio, but you can pull some doors in, and it's, it's an enclosed space. But we don't we're not fighting climatic conditions here, so we're very much can can really push the envelope, if you will, of the connection of inside and outside and really make it indistinguishable. So the other part of, you know, building on a slab as opposed to a raised floor is that, you know, part of and going back to the idea about, um, you know, post-war is that they wanted to build homes economically, albeit this is a home in, in, in Beverly Hills, but when they were building homes economically, they could build a slab on grade and it was very quick and inexpensive way to uh, to to build homes very very quickly and it had but it had it had other aspects to it this idea of the uh, the radiant heating and the like and there's just a lot of very clever things that were done there's a lot of attention to the idea of of making inside and outside indistinguishable in in contemporary uh, 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 homes in in Los Angeles. And 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 Southern California and actually deal with energy and um, passive solar, having overhangs, having um, you know shading the uh, windows as opposed to putting curtains on windows. You know, doing a lot of passive architectural um, moves that would make the house uh, be just like a tent. You know, it's just a roof above you, and everything else is open. Um, and those were, um, you know, you could only do that in an environment where you could have glass, so much glass, and not worry about freezing in the winter time. Um, so there's also another historical thing. I won't belabor all of this, but but John was was talking about post war, and we're trying to kind of put a put a timeline on all of this. So, so these two names, Schindler and Neutra, Neutra they're they're really the the the, the most important uh, European modernists that came to the United States. And Schindler, um, we're gonna we're, we're looking now to. I'm glad you're bringing this, showing this. So Sh Rudolf Schindler was a Viennese architect who saw the work that Frank Lloyd Wright was doing, decided to come to the United States to work with Wright, and he ultimately did, and ultimately went on his own, and and shockingly and to our great benefit, ended up in Los Angeles, California. This Viennese modernist architect ended up in Los Angeles, California. He built many, many buildings. He was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. He, some say, did did better work than Frank Lloyd Wright. This is a this is a 16-unit apartment building that Tosh and I had the privilege, we're still at it, of, of restoring. That's a Rudolf Schindler uh, apartment complex built in between 20, 1926 and 39 or 55. 55, there's five buildings on a site. We're in the process. We've restored three of the buildings. There's two more buildings to restore. Um, this was uh, this was just a magnificent place. But this was the it's these ideas that were literally through Wright and through some of the European modernists who came here were interpreted by the architects of the 50s and of the 60s that became the mid-century modern. This, this is the source of these things. And, and California permitted so much uh, freedom to, to explore these things because climatically we were able to really open up a house and use these modern plans. And, and they can also be done very economically too, relating to the sort of post-war housing boom. The photographs you're seeing now are very, um, it's a very eclectic 
a collection of, of these five different buildings with 16 apartment units that are all different. But this is sort of some of these buildings were existing buildings that that uh, Schindler uh, renovated and and turned into his own. But there's just a lot of creativity and excitement and cleverness about about the way um, uh, fenestration was handled. And and they they they've become in Southern California a very sought after uh, uh, architecture. Sheila can speak to this. You know, if a Neutra house comes up for sale, it's a feeding frenzy. There are so many people out there. Right. Is this in Truesdale Estates or the one that you were talking about in Beverly Hills? Was that in Truesdale Estates? The one that was, it's, um, I don't know if that's that's considered Truesdale. It's north of Sunset. No. I don't think it's Truesdale. It's, it's. Uh, but, okay. It, like, let's, let's look at this. This is, this is Schindler, 1926. Now, Schindler was new to wood construction. He learned that he could use plywood. He can use, you know, he's in a new world now. He's using plywood and wood for the entire interior of this 300 square foot apartment building, apartment unit. So, you know, from there, the younger architects interpreted his ideas of wood ceiling, incorporating light, you know, using the space between joists and roof rafters for lights and really understanding wood construction in a more uh, expressive way, as opposed to how we do it now where we cover we everything better. with drywall. You know, He wanted to show how the skeleton of a wood construction would work. And therefore comes the post and beam California architecture where it takes, takes from this, uh, we call it the father of, uh, California architecture from, and then you can see that the relationship where from this, it goes to a ranch or ranch houses or post and beam homes where, you know, things are exposed and expressed. By the way, this, this, uh, this apartment, it's called Manola Court. It's, it's in the Silver Lake area up on a hillside with beautiful views of. of now you can uh, see, you know, how the wood construct, these are all, these are his ideas about exposing wood and showing it, you know, wood studs on the outside of the building. You know, these are not, um, it's very different way of thinking about wood construction than we do now. So- uh, what, I, what type of wood is that? What sort of durability is there? Doesn't it, have any. <laughs> it's Douglas fir, it needs to be, these, these buildings need to be cared for. It would have been neglected for years and years. These are buildings that absolutely need to be cared for. And as long as we're around, we're going to make sure they are. Yeah, this one, you know, it, it had to be painted and it had to be sanded. All, you know, the, everything had to be redone, but uh, it withstood about 85 years. <laughs> I mean, it's, part, go it's, ahead. Pine, it's pine, right? I mean, we're, yes, we're looking right. at Douglas plywood. Douglas Douglas it's pine. Pine. Yes, it's Douglas pine, Douglas but it's a little harder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Not much. Yeah. John, just an FYI, Silver Lake is a popular area as well. It's an artist haven, and there's a lot of MCM architecture in that area, and it's yes, very beautiful, and it's in demand. And um, where is that geographically with regards to Brentwood itself? It's east. It's, it's, it's close, north of downtown. It's it's northwest of downtown. It's it's a ten minute drive to downtown uh it, but it's also up it also is up in the hills um so it affords these the, every apartment unit has a view of the hollywood sign and the griffith observatory and it's uh um it's a it's a very nice community is but it I'm, on the map i'm showing uh, it would never it's, be to, it's to your right it's yes, to your it's, right close to be. downtown if you get to downtown you'll be you'll be close okay where it says Griffith Los Angeles, Park, yeah. Griffith Park. Just okay, you see where Griffith that Park. lake is? Do you yeah. see where that? Hold on. My see? daughter Stadium. Yes. Do you see Correct. that little lake? Yeah, there's Silver Lake. It says it on the map. It said it on the map. There, right underneath the lake, it says Silver Lake. Okay. And John, FYI, we here at Douglas Element have several listings in MCM listings in Truesdale Estates and in Silver Lake. So are people willing to pay up for it? Is it considered an art house and does it add value? 
to the per square foot to be yeah. an MCM, to have a name brand ar architect. It does because you have, you have an appreciation. You have the clients who are cultured and who appreciate that style and, and, and they understand the style as, as you know, such as yourself, you understand the style you have. So I'm going to put you on the spot because because you're a professional and you're supposed to know these things. But so if I have an ordinary modern or I have a Neutra, what does it add to the value? If I have an ordinary modern or oh, I have a Schindler, well, I, you, what does I, it I, add? I'll, 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 I would just throw a number out there. I'll say it'll go up 60% of value if you have a name like Neutra attached. I mean, you have, you know, the Chemisphere House, you have the Stall House. There are many pockets of MCM architecture here. So this, we, we just have, um, you know, a small uh, area here in Brentwood, but it's throughout LA and, and there are just many, many iconic homes. But I would, I would say it would add 60%. That's a big number. It, it, it is a big number, but I, you know, when you say modern homes and so, mo you know, modern, um, People want, you're in LA, people want the name. It, it, it is just, you know, what it is. Um, but by, by the way, this Frank Lloyd Wright house just came on in New Canaan yesterday. Um, this is the Rayford house of 56. And it just came on the market yesterday. And just to give you a sense, for $8 million. <laughs> now, the average house in New Canaan is $2 million. <laughs> And that house is eight million dollars because it's a Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, I would say how that big, how big is the house? How big is the land? Like, give me some perspective on that. Please. On that one, yeah, that probably had eight acres. I think they sold the others all at the time. I think they've sold off most of it. I think it's down to uh, two to four acres, and they've sold off the other lots. And so, the interior, like number of bedrooms. I mean, just like practical stuff. Just curious. There's no nothing, one's buying it for practicality. I there's guess. nothing practical it's, about that. It's <laughs> like buying a Picasso because, you know, it's, you know, a certain size. And I don't know. And by but, the way, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, interest in doing a lot of wood is almost unique on that house. There's a lot of uh, concrete. So the Rayford house of 56, lots of concrete, uh, although Frank Lloyd Wright always added overhangs and wood. It's one of the things that uh, Scott was just showing me, uh, the overhangs, uh, I think is distinctly Californian. We don't have the overhangs, for instance, on the glass house. Uh, and here's the most recent version. And this is my segue, Roberto, to my sponsor. Grace Farms just made this beautiful modern building. It's called the River Building. That's it from the sky. You see, it's got a, a shiny uh, silver roof and it stretches about a quarter mile down the hill. Uh, Grace Farms is our sponsor and they sponsor this show because they're interested in design for freedom, uh, sustainable, uh, ethical building materials. And I want to talk a minute uh, in a minute about that. But this is the most the newest modern architecture that we have east. And once again, there's not a lot of interest in wood. There's an interest in glass and there's an interest in open plan, but we don't do predominantly wood like you do in California. You know, it's it's much more difficult to build a mid-century modern house now in California because we have many more regulations for earthquake and and we have to have a lot of steel connections and wrap it in wood if we want to make it look like wood. So the houses that were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s are almost impossible to build right now. So one of the reasons they are so much sought after is because you can't really get them anymore. Uh, Does your zone planning and zoning make allowances for the historical value yes. of these homes? Well, they have to be designated, and a lot of times we do things that you know they don't know anything about. But um, but yes, we have to um, yes, like the Schindler uh, property that we just showed you. It's a historic building, and we had a lot of things that we had to get around was because you know the building had no structure. Literally, what was holding it up, we don't know. Uh, we had to put in a lot of steel to make it 
and still make it look like it we used to look like. So mid-century modern homes are very difficult to build right now. At the, you know, Scott's father built their house in 1957, eight. Yeah, yeah. They bought the lot and the house for $40,000. They built it from scratch. In Brentwood, yeah. Now, now, obviously that's 65 years ago, but even if you add inflation and all of that stuff, you just can't build that house yeah. anymore for those prices. And, and that that's a, now we're looking at another house, but but I was going to just mention that the, that the whole discussion that Tosh is bringing up here about the structure and everything is another discussion about mid-century modern and the like. The, the ironic thing, of course, is that, um, is that um, all of these homes that are put together with little sticks and little metal nails have withstood multiple earthquakes and done very, very well. So in spite of all the additional requirements that we have that make it so difficult to, to build these mid-century type building, post and beam buildings now, they do very, very well in, uh, in our environment of, of earthquakes. The glass may shatter, but... Yeah, well, but we have tempered glass now, so... Yeah, yeah. well, you can go back to that other uh, post and beam house that you, you had up. Just, uh, yeah. And so this is designed by Quincy Jones. I don't know if you're familiar with this particular developer in the 60s who was also, he used to, his name is- um, Joseph Eichler. Joseph Eichler. He used to live in a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house. And when he moved to California, he decided that he wanted to build um, similar houses. So he hired young architects like um, Ash and Allen and Quincy Jones and designed developments in, City of Orange, which is in Orange County, in Thousand Oaks, and mostly in Northern California, in um, all over Northern California. There are many more developments there. Um, so this is a house that we bought one okay. years yeah. ago. This is in Thousand Oaks, and you, you can see it's, you know, post and beam to its true name. But again, if we were to design this house now, we would have to put a hell of a lot of steel in it. But this house has withstood a lot of um, earthquakes already. Let me, let, let me ask you a question. Let's just say I came to you. I said, look, I, I bought this, this piece of land. I have an acre here or whatever it is in, in Brentwood. And I want to build a house. And I'm conflicted. I'm, you know, I, I really, you know, my wife wants me to buy, you know, to build a traditional house. But I really, really, really want to build and, or, and design a, you know, uh, a mid-century home. And you know the budget is three million dollars. You know, if it's three million dollars for a traditional house, does it cost four and a half to build a mid-century modern house? To give you an example, the house, the Beverly Hills house that we restored earlier, we didn't add a square inch. We remodeled the entire house, obviously with very high-end material. They spent four million dollars. It's a forty. It's a forty-two hundred square foot house. Okay, but that's that. I'm just there's a quality. To be honest, to be honest, that house. I'm saying ground up. Ground up, three million dollars. How many square feet? Well, let's just say that same house. You spent four and a half million dollars restoring. You couldn't. No. You couldn't build that house. No. No. If I said, "Look, why, why can't you build it?" Well, you can build it. But... Well, you could. <laughs> you need more money. <laughs> Okay, but I'm just, so so. What would that cost? What would it cost? Well, I don't think I don't think the I don't think the additional cost is is you know fifty percent more. I think it's it's you know it might be twenty percent more to build it to build it that way. And and you know we've been as architects, um, we have been uh, Roberto, we've been very much influenced by all this experience and how I grew up and the neighborhood that I grew up in. And um, uh, and when we design new homes, we we tend towards mid-century modern kind of aesthetics and 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 projects. And uh, um, uh, I, I think I think they're competitive. If you go down this list, you'll see a new home that we designed. No. Keep going. Uh, no. Keep, no, no, it's I think. Oh, there it is. The West Side Residence. So that's a that's a house that we're that's in design now in our office. 
So there's some definite influences of uh, mid-century modern. There's overhangs, there's large glass expanses. But you um, lost the wood, no wood. No, actually it's painted. <laughs> <laughs> There is one. Yeah. Um, so, and this is the front of this house, and this is going to be. This was a. This is going to be a three million dollar house, and it's. It, but it's got a very modest front to it, and and uh, so uh, we're we're very much influenced by by uh, by all those experiences that we've had. I don't think I want to answer your question, Roberto. I don't think that uh, you know when Tosh says, I mean when she says you can't do it, you can do it, but it's there there. Um, because of we have something called an earthquake here <laughs> and we're and when you have you know buildings that have lots of glass and not very many walls and you're building sort of post and beam you have to really make solid buildings so it gets uh, more demanding but it isn't it isn't uh, it isn't impossible to get there it's not if somebody says i want to have that kind of a building we we design that kind of a building. We engineer it properly. You know, it would yeah, cost. I mean, so and so, so you just tell the people you're going to need a bigger, bigger budget. Yeah. A little. A, you're going to need. You might. You're going to need a little bit bigger budget. But you know, honestly, when it comes to you know the work that we do, the the finish selection and and some of the other parts of the building have such a big impact on the cost as well that that if we have to if we have to go a little further with the structure on it. It's it's not so dramatic. It's not so dramatic. So I want to introduce you now to Scott Hobbs. Scott Hobbs is down there in the uh, uh, and he's a builder of homes in this area. And I, one thing that struck me, and I wonder if it's striking Scott, is that you got you guys have a lot of stucco in L.A. And I don't think Scott's been asked to make a stucco house maybe ever in, in Connecticut. How come, Scott? And um, what's the difference that you see in the construction here in LA versus what we're doing? I mean, awful lot of flat roofs, and we're not doing a lot of flat roofs here. Well, we it, it's, I mean, actually, we're, we're doing a stucco job as we speak right now. So <laughs> times do change, and we're doing a lot of stuff. And I, I think, and we're doing a lot of flat roofs. We're seeing much more contemporary slash modern um, construction. Um, it, it's, you know, California with the fire dangers and with the, uh, and with, uh, uh, earthquake stuff has, again, special rules. It absolutely has special rules. Um, and meanwhile, I think people out in California, it's, it's depending on the exact location, you tend to be drier, you know, it, it, in some places it only rains, you know, you know, for that one week out of the year. Whereas uh, in Connecticut, you can, of course, bet that it'll rain every single day, you know, every week out of the year. But when um, I've asked you how much to make me a house like this, I asked the same question of you that, that Roberto asked. You always say, oh, yeah, you need to double your budget, John, to get this kind of modern look. And I say, why? Why? Well, you, you've got it. It's the devil's in the details. I mean, it's, you can do a very simplistic one that maybe you're around 800 a square foot. But then very quickly, you start tacking up to 1,200, 13, 14, 1,500 a square foot. I mean, a big reason comes from the glass. So instead of doing, you know, simple, you know, structures on the outside, you're doing very high performance glass. And I think that's one of the issues that came up as far as why it costs increased so much. You know, you go back and look in some of the 1950s. I mean, you got storefront window panes there, single strength glass, huge. Energy was cheap. You didn't have to meet all the uh, all the codes, so you could do things that were not necessarily really advisable. Um, trying to get a, a mechanical system to work well inside of one of these homes is tricky. You don't have a lot of walls. You have a lot more glass. You have a lot more open spaces, and so th there's just a lot of details that that can make the cost go higher and make the house into something really really special. So that's a question. And. Um I just wanted to also add that, you know, houses that have a lot of moldings in them, they're covering, covering mistakes. <laughs> in a modern, a modern house, straight lines, when you want, when you look at something that it looks very simple, it's very hard to get to make it look that way because you're trying to hide things and anyhow, but you have to be much more crafty about it. And that gets to be expensive. I mean, we're finishing up a, a monster home right now that has, you know, the, the long hallways, like over 200 feet long with a lot of turns and, and twists. And you've got quarter inch reveals that go through the whole thing. Oh, my gosh. And it means every single bit of this house has to be perfect. You can't be off by anything. Nothing. 
I mean, and you know, we have doors that are 10, that was, we have door openings that are 10 feet high and doors that are nine feet, 11 and uh, seven eighths. So, I mean, we've got like a 16th of an inch top or bottom. I, it's, you, you can't have a speck of dust in the wrong spot as you're putting something in or it's not gonna work. But, you know, that that is one way of doing modern architecture. And I, I wanna say that distinguishes a little bit from what the mid-century modern architecture is. It's not, mid-century modern did allow for mistakes and that does allow for different textures to happen at the same place and not be so um, dogmatic about lines being straight. So I wanna say there is, I mean, we have now what's contemporary architecture, let's call it as opposed to modern, uh, we have come to a different place where we want to make things look more sleek. They're not, they weren't as sleek then. Um, so I think that's what's the warmth that mid-century modern homes have are because of that, because uh, they allowed for those mistakes. So they allowed, but not, you know, it, it wasn't covered in molding, but it had some um, warmth about it, you know, with, you know, mahogany wood panels that you don't see right now in all these new contemporary homes that are just white and gray and black. So um, so I, that's why I think the mid-century modern is much more um, in demand for people because it's, they can, flexible. They, it's flexible. People can see themselves living in it. It's, um, you know, it doesn't have so much custom personality where they have to tear it out and make it their own. They can actually live with what this, you know, the simplicity of the building that was there. Um, so that's uh, that's why I think they're in demand. Is there some flavor of intention in mid-century modern in a sense that like just what you're talking about, it's not perfect. There's a human quality to it. There's an intention for this where now things are in some ways, some things are so perfect, they're like, machine manufactured right. and it's cold. I mean, is there a flavor of that too, you know, when you yeah. walk in these homes? Yeah, I think I think part of it is 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 scale and proportion is that, um, you know, a lot of contemporary homes are there uh, or modern homes, you know, we use these words and they're they're loaded and they and they mean different things. And when you say a modern home, you, you know, modernism started in the early teens, <laughs> 19, you know, the, the, that's when modernism started. So, you know, it's that's a lot of material to cover right there. But, who are we crediting? Walter Gropius, who are we crediting? Who's in, who in the teens? Well, you know, <laughs> well, the Bauhaus, I mean, I mean, you can, you, there, there, well, there's international style. I mean, yeah. Schindler came from the beginning of modernism and, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright is American modern, which, you know, there's a whole other thing about that. So, so Frank Lloyd Wright did the Roby House in 1906. And that is a wholly modern building. And that's a hundred, almost 120 years old. So, but my point about the mid-century modern houses are, is that I think, uh, and Tosh was touching on this too, is that, that there is a sense of scale and proportion in these kinds of homes that make them very much accessible. We're looking at the Roby house now, which is a wildly modern house 120 years ago. But there's a sense of scale and proportion in mid-century modern homes that is very appealing to, to, to homeowners, to people that wanna have a family and a home and feel comfortable in the kinds of, of, of sort of, we'll call, I'll, pull, I'll say modern in quotation homes where they're, they become very austere and they aren't careful about proportion and scale and they aren't careful about, about introducing uh, more organic materials, which are much more pleasing and much more acceptable and much more accepting to people. Um, those are the kinds of things that make mid-century modern homes uh, uh, appealing because they, they, they understand the scale of a, of a person living in them and and even even you know the house that we have in Thousand Oaks, which was this Quincy Jones house, which was not a it was a 2000, 20, 15, 1900, 1900 square foot house. We added a little bit of square footage to it. It had four foot overhangs that went all the way around the building. You know this is the master bedroom looking out into the rear yard. It the seal the bottom of those beams are at seven feet. 
right. and nine inches above my head. So I mean, in any other world, that would be that would be a squatter's house, you know. In this <laughs> house, it feels like you have this really comfortable, lightweight, almost like Tosh said, tent-like structure over your head that covers you. When you sit in this room, in the in the living room by the fireplace. And it's raining outside and it's raining in your courtyard and it's raining out the windows to the other side. There isn't a better feeling. There is not a better feeling. Than but you also, yourself. you know, look at all the structural pieces. These are these were standard uh, wood members that they could buy. I mean, everything was designed about around what was available at the time to build really quickly. They didn't customize it. Nothing just, is customized. Yeah, they just put it together and then they put some PNG two by decking on the roof, and they were done. It was almost like an IKEA <laughs> thing, where they they create they really came up with a system of construction, beams at seven and a half feet apart, seven feet seven, feet, seven apart. feet apart. You know that's that's how you run this. There is no attic space. The roofing, the roof decking is your ceiling as well. So it went really really quickly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they, they figured it out how to build homes very fast after World War II. And they're very, and they're, at, and at the same time, there's a kind of elegance about them. There's no stuff that, that, that I think that, that people recognize, maybe unconsciously, they recognize the elegance of them, you know, without using very costly materials and the like, it, it just, it sort of floats, the light is nice and, and, uh, I mean, now, you must you must uh you must feel the response of people who chase the Neutras and the Schindlers and the Quincy Jones and the and the few there's Frank Lloyd Wright there's a Frank Lloyd Wright house in Brentwood um uh, uh there's there's a, a a serious appeal to these things for people I think I, as far as scale, that's my favorite design element and scale is everything to me, but I think also the ease of living in these homes, they're just easy, living is easy. Uh, but also that I think the aesthetic, I think that the, the furniture of that era, you know, mid-century modern furniture, you know, Saren and tables and, and um, you know, Ames chairs and so on. It, everything was just so sexy, you know, that the way that the, there was just a really nice nuance, um, you know, in these homes that uh, just made them appealing and and um, in demand. So when people come to town, a guy like me shows up and it says, I, I picked Brentwood. I think I want Brentwood because I, I, I like the neighborhood to raise a family and I like the schools. Uh, can you find me? What do they ask for? They ask for private backyards. Do they ask for a modern. Can I do you have something in a modern? Um, for a long time in Connecticut, that was a dirty word. Everybody says, I want a colonial. I want a center hall colonial. And we have oh. center hall colonials with pitched roofs. Well, and uh, it was only a minority of, of the requests came in for modern design. Would you say most of the people coming out to LA want that LA design, be it mid-century or current? Uh, yeah, I think that people when they come here, they want they want the California dream. But I think more importantly, they want the uh, the backyard. <laughs> you know, land is always in demand. Um, but yes, I think that modern and a pool. Well, that yeah, a pool. But uh, I don't see too many MCM pools here anymore. I don't. I just see you know people sometimes will just do new construction. Uh, I would tell you a lot of um, this modern farmhouse construction is, is kind of taking over so uh, but you in know, LA yeah in, in, in these areas just because it's new uh, but for the enthusiasts who do want it yeah I mean it's here and um, but but I think more than anything they want the backyard whether there's a pool or not so um, how big are the lots what is what is a plaza I mean is, is it a half acre lot no not that um, well, it, it just depends. I mean, because we do have a lot of hillside terrain. Um, it, it, it could be um, le less than a half acre. So I want, I want to interject here before, because I have about a minute and a half, and I do want to thank our sponsor. I mentioned before Grace Farms. I want to mention it again. I'm going to hit share screen briefly, and I'm going to show you 
the sauna building. Okay, this is the river building that they designed. It's incredible. Sauna is an architecture firm out of uh, Japan. They won the Pritzker Prize for this building. And it is an amazing building. The nonprofit Grace Farms in this building has got the design for freedom. The way we can all support it is by ordering at gracefarms.org this very attractive box with coffee and coffee and tea. These are the sips. 30 seconds. Those are the sips and those are the drips. As our closing gifts, and, ten, and um, all profits go toward the Design for Freedom effort, which is for sustainable and ethical treatment of in building materials. We're going to continue the conversation, even though they're going to cut us off on Voice America. I want to thank Scott and Raybar and Sheila and my co-host, Roberto, and my, my uh, guest, Scott Hobbs. Thank you all for episode 87. Thanks. Thank you. And we're clear. Great show. I'll let you guys continue. Have a fantastic week. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, um, what I want to say, you, you were talking about zoning and, and lot size, or Roberto was talking about lot size. You know, new laws dictate that now when someone moves, your lot could be susceptible to a, a, a two, um, a two uh, home lot because of the housing crisis. So now there's a, a home, two homes actually on one lot on San Vicente. And this went up about three years ago and it's the first one that I've seen, but now with zoning, you can have two homes on one lot. So to answer your question, the lots are getting smaller. Well, that's the accessory dwelling unit rule, right? That you're talking about? No, these, this is a full house. Both of them are, are, are a full house, but you can't uh, have an ADU, but it could be smaller, but I'm talking about two homes on one lot. I think it's, it's East of Carmelina on San Vicente. I think it's uh, 11287 and 11 or 12287 and 12285. They have their own addresses, but they're on one lot. I was just curious because John had, had asked if the yard was really the attraction and you said yes. So I'm just wondering how big those yards can actually be. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it, it's, it's, there's, I don't want to say, there's really no rhyme, no reason. So you, you just never know what you're going to get. They're not that big unless you're up in Brentwood uh, country estates. That's where Arnold Schwarzenegger lives. That's where Dr. Dre lives. Um, and I think there are like six other parcels up there. You know, they have the bigger lots, but those are, you know, in a gated community and um, hard to get. Um, and, and Scott, I'm so sorry I mispronounced your last name. My mind just went blank. So I didn't even notice. So it was great. Yeah, I did. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I am Scott Strumwasser, and my partner is Tosh Rabar. Right. Well, I remember her spelling, but, right. uh, but I, my, my mind went blank on your last name. That's right. So That's is that wreaking havoc, all these new zoning laws, wreaking havoc on the real estate market? It seems to me, and insofar as it relates to mid-century modern preservation, um, that if zoning laws allow two houses where there used to be allowed one, it puts even more pressure to knock down a house like the one we just saw, the single level house on Stoddard and replace it with two bigger houses. Um, is, there, is there a tendency to knock down the mid-century moderns? We're I, finding that problem in New Canaan, Connecticut. I, I think there's a map that details uh, where these homes are located. I, I think that, you know, there's some kind of formula where you can only do maybe one in um, three, a three block uh, row. But this goes back to SB 50. I don't know if people remember that. I don't even know if people know about this. They do know about ULA, but SB 50 dictates that you can now build, a builder can come in and build, I think up to eight units, uh, you know, in a building, there will be no parking. Um, and it just puts many restrictions, but what it's trying to do is open up for affordable housing. So you can have a $12 million home in Brentwood Park and someone two doors up from you moves, well, a builder can come in and build, you know, an eight unit structure. 
And it's, it's you know, it's, I'm, it's, I'm not sure if that's, uh, I'm not sure about that. What we understand and uh, from our work, and we've done many of these, uh, John, you referred to the ADU. It's just the, 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 what we know about is that for what's called an R1 property, zoned R1 for a single family residence, the state of California has mandated that R1 property, single family properties, are obligated to permit a second dwelling unit on it called an accessory dwelling unit. It's limited to 1,200 square feet. It has other restrictions. It's eased the, the requirement for parking, but all of this is in an effort to address a wildly out of control housing shortage in the state of California. And um, I think from a real estate point of view, there's been a lot of uh, you know, concern about this because it's changing characters of, of neighborhoods. I think there's ways to do this in responsible ways, and there's architectural opportunities that are available. That we they're one of our projects. We we worked on the main house for a client in the in 2015, and six years later, five years later, they came back to us and asked us for an ADU. We used we used their property sort of responsibly, and 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 now they have a second unit on it, and it doesn't feel like. The neighborhood's changed. It feels like it has an accessory building on it that's carefully designed. And uh, um, uh, but yeah, it's 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 impactful and it's profound. It is profound because the the idea of a single family house and that whole concept is is uh, is a little different. It's a little different now. But but if they build an eight uh, a unit building, they're just not going to have a place to park. So I, I think everyone's concerned about parking on the streets and so on, and the congestion that it's going to. Yeah, but LA is changing now. We have we have other forms of transportation that are starting to develop, and we've we have the you know commercial Uber and Lyft, and so parking it, it, cars are. Yeah, parking are requirements are a relationship of how close you are to public transportation. And that changes it depending on what limit, neighborhood it, you are. Yeah, it permits you to limit the parking. But yeah, there's 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 a lot of issues that are involved in in, in all of this. But uh, but it's uh, it's we're you know the state is trying to address the fact that there's lots of people that want to live here and there isn't enough places. Right. There isn't enough housing. Yeah. Are all those a, 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 uh, all those ADUs uh, going to bring the average price down from three point four million dollars in Brentwood? Is that no, going to come not, down? They're going to they're going to raise it because they're being used not just as rental units, but they're being used as mother in law units. They're being used as as yeah, offices goodness. within your house, within your property that you because a lot of people are working from home. Caregivers can live there. It's it it provides an enormous amount of flexibility from the perspective of architects that have worked for decades remodeling and building new residences. The ADU laws have been a good thing. They have been a good thing for us. Yes. They they provide work, but and I and we, but we recognize that for homeowners that live in a single family residence, it changes character. It change it's it changes something fundamental and profound about the idea of having your property in a single family residence. There's you cannot build eight units on a on an R1 lot. You can build two. So but so so and and. And we've always felt that, you know, if you're responsible and you're a qualified and talented architect and designer, you can you can make something that's uh, that that will raise the value. It will not it will not lower the value. We're not talking about rural housing here. <laughs> <You> <laughs> yeah. know. No, that's no, that's not it. But, but it's my understanding that that they can build like eight uh, an eight unit building. No, that's not no. That no, no, not really. No. That's I mean, so that's you. We're not talking about SB fifty. Are you all talking about SB fifty? I don't know what the the. Yeah, I think I, SB fifty. You can. But it's I, not I mean, R one R one lots can have a second unit. They cannot have eight units. They can have a right, second it, unit. Right. I ha I have a, a a client on Gorham here in Brentwood, and they have R two zoning. They it, it, they ran out both uh, uh, homes, but um, but I do think that with SB fifty, I'm not a hundred percent. We're still in the infancy stages of it. it, it you know, it just passed a few years ago. Um, I, I think that eventually they can do um, the you know eight unit buildings, but. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's just my understanding. I don't know. I could be wrong. So, so back to the economics, the $3.4 million median in Brentwood is going to go up, not only because of ADUs, but because the California economy is doing so well. I mean, we've been hearing that there's been some cracks in the you know uh, that 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 there's been some anxiety over the over the market in California. Is it misplaced anxiety? Well, what happened? There's just no inventory. No one wants to. They're not putting their home on the market, and there's not. Um, there's not. Um, um, I'm sorry. Someone's trying to come in. Uh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, but um, the Remember, um, John, they have also are instituting transfer taxes there. Well, yeah, that's the ULA. Any uh, five thousand to ten thousand, or I'm, I'm sorry, five million to ten million. There's a four percent increase in the transfer tax. Above ten million, it's five point five percent, I think. But in Santa Monica, it goes from five to eight million. And I think we just discussed this. I think there's like a, a, a Three percent increase from five to eight million. But your prediction is that prices will continue to go up in California, despite the high cost of living, despite yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the challenging what political situation where people are like, I'm out of here, I'm going to Texas. But despite all of that and high gas prices and so many other things, but you're you confident to- prices are going to continue to go up in the LA market. Yes, they, they appreciate. But what happens is we, you know, we have tech here. I, um, we have had, we have had an exodus of 5,000 people, 500,000 people. But I think those are, you know, that's first time families in, in middle America who go for um, a better life so in, in Idaho. But I think that the homes here will continue to be in demand. And with the tech people, um, the, the concern is buyers and their buying power. So I think, you know, the lenders, they have um, programs for first time home buyers, but it's just getting them to, to buy it. Um, See, in Connecticut, we lost all the very rich people. They all went down to Florida. And I thought all the really rich people left California and went down to Austin. So. Well, you, you do have that. You do have the Elon Musks and, and, and other people. But I mean, still tech here, I, I, I think pretty much dictates the market. That's just my opinion. That's what okay. I see. So Brentwood's still a good investment and, and should be for the next several years. I think so. Brentwood is a fabulous neighborhood. And, you know, Scott and Tosh can uh, attest. Okay. And another, uh, we're, we're always compared to Pacific Palisades also. That's West. And you always you have ocean views of Pacific Palisades. But what the speaking of topography, it's hilly in um, Pacific Palisades. That's why I like Brentwood. It's just because it's flat. You know, you were talking about scale and MCM. It's just the ease of living. I love this area. And when you hear about us, Globally, people always say the Tony neighborhood of Los Angeles. Brentwood is a Tony neighborhood of Los Angeles. And I think we are. But I again, I, I think it's the Mayberry Phil. It's, you know, the unassuming areas, but still it's a high net worth. And you have all the amenities. We have great restaurants. We have Voltaire, which is, um, they, I don't want to say it was a Michelin star, but they were Michelin honored. Does that make sense? Anyway, we have, you know, great restaurants and uh, a lot of playgrounds. Brentwood Country Mart is really nice. Parents love to take their families there. You know, their kids there. They have toy stores, bookstores, and and you know, chicken, a uh, ready chick. Um, it, it's just you know, it's family oriented. Well, thank you. Now <laughs> I'll let Scott and Tosh make their, I guess, I don't know, any closing remarks, and uh, I'll let Roberto and Scott tell me what they learned this hour. So go ahead, Scott. Um, I guess I thank you for the invitation to participate in this. Um, uh, um, you know, for myself, it's you know, the subject matter of Brentwood, you know, hits home. It's it's it was my home. It's where I grew up. And uh, um, you know, Tosh and I have uh, done many projects in that neighborhood. And uh, uh, you know, mid-century modern. Uh, projects have been very influential in our in our careers 
Um, so uh, uh, this uh, I feel like we were a good fit to to participate in this, and and thank you all for uh, for letting us be a part of this. Great, thanks for coming. It's wonderful. Thank I think you. that uh, Brentwood is uh, it like <laughs> Sheila was saying that. Uh, the American, you know, the California dream is really alive in Brentwood. You can find it there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I wouldn't want to be in any other neighborhood. So there's something for everyone here in Brentwood. And Tosh? Um, <laughs> not for everyone in Brentwood. <laughs> I want to make sure that we all understand, you know, that the uh, annual income in Brentwood is not... Um, we, you there's, know. South, there's South Brentwood, there are condos here and their apartments. So we do have, you know, that rental uh, community and, and the condo community in South Brentwood. Right. But if you're young and you want more land, then yes, maybe it's not, uh, you know, you want to seek elsewhere, but right. the ability is fabulous here, uh, you know, with San Vicente and all the shops. It's just easy. I find it's easy if you're in New York and you want a nice neighborhood where you can just walk around everywhere and not need a car for what is your area so uh, I bring it walk right. yeah. it's it's a beautiful neighborhood uh you know it sounds like paradise I mean yeah, I have a new appreciation right. for it yes <laughs> it's gonna have to come out come yes. and visit John I will Tosh. thank you yeah Tosh thank you Sheila it. I will visit thank you Scott Tosh thank and thank you. you again Roberto for another fabulous hour for Rose and Burbs next week we are uh, in Aspen where none of the architecture is going to look like what we just saw. No single pane glass, no flat roofs, um, and um, no swimming pools, I think. I don't know. We're going to meet the mayor of Aspen, Tory, and we're going to learn all about the explosive Colorado market. So till then, thank you all, and see you next week. Bye, guys. See you, Skipper. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.